Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all this morning. Glad that you're well enough to be here. And uh, we certainly want to be looking out for one another and reaching out to those who are uh, sick at this time. As has been mentioned, there are several, uh, several in our congregation that are not feeling well this morning. I want to talk to you this morning about something of great importance and the idea of spiritual planning. If you look at Acts chapter 2 as just a, a starting spot for this, just to make the point as to the importance of planning, Acts chapter 2, we read about a good plan that God made. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. When Peter begins to preach, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The predetermined plan, and that's an interesting phrase that is being used there. The purpose or the counsel, which is what God's expectation was. That is, God had a plan from the beginning of which He was offering salvation unto us. We see that it was determined before the foundations of the world, and that's in Ephesians chapter 1. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm pretty confident in saying this. You're happy about this plan. I'm happy about this plan. That God wanted us to be reconciled back to Him. And He made an opportunity for us to have salvation and that our soul can be secure. Spiritual strength is found in this plan. And so it's important to us in that way that God's plan of salvation is not only available to us, but we can read about it, we can understand it, and we can implement what He wants in our life. We're thankful for the love shown to us in that and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. It's the most important plan throughout your Bible from the beginning to the end. Planning is a way in which we can utilize God's blessings. And as we make plans for this year and for the next to come and for the days and years after that, it's going to be important for us to make adequate and appropriate plans. I'm turning to Exodus chapter 26. When people in the Bible were tasked with doing something of great importance, they were going to try to accomplish something of great importance, they were given plans by God in which to accomplish them. In Exodus 26, as Moses is beginning to build the tabernacle, he's going to follow God's plan. In verse 30, it says, Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown in the mountain. And it is that you read throughout and you think, boy, this is just uh, example of, of intricate detail after intricate detail of this plan that God wants for him to utilize. As you turn to the next chapter or, or next page, give me chapter 27 and verse 8, he says, You shall make it hollow with planks as it was shown to you in the mountains, so they shall make it. You have to make this according to God's plan. And you re- that's what you read about as you continue reading through the end of Exodus. In chapter 31 and in verse 6, he says, And, and behold, I myself have appointed him with oh, uh, Oholiab, uh, the son of, uh, of that guy. I'm not going to try his name, but at the end of the verse, he says, And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill, that they may make all that I have commanded you. What is it that God wants? I want you to make it, and I want you to make it as I've told you. Verse 11, and the anointing will also the fragrant incense for the holy place. They're to make them according to all that I have commanded you. God's plan was given, and they simply had the responsibility to implement it. So you're going to go build this tabernacle, Moses. Well, how? You're going to build it exactly as I want you to. That's what God's telling him to do. He gave him specifics for that. You want to accomplish something for God? You do it how God wants you to do it. As you turn to 1 Chronicles just a little further, just as another example. 1 Chronicles 28. And in 1 Chronicles uh, 28, you see that David was king. And he was not allowed to build the temple of God in Jerusalem. His son Solomon was going to be tasked with that. In 1 Chronicles 28. So he's not allowed to build it, but he makes preparations for it. He does all that he can. He piles up supplies, and then he's going to essentially hand off the plans 
to his son Solomon. In 1 Chronicles 28 and in verse 10, it says, Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be courageous and act. Now, I want us to remember that phrase. We'll use it again in the lesson. Be courageous and act. Do this, in other words, courageously, that God wants you to do. Then David gave to his son Solomon the plan of the porch of the temple, its buildings, its storehouses, its upper rooms, its inner rooms, and the room for the mercy seat. Verse 19 All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me all the details of this pattern. So Solomon, you're going to build this temple. You're going to build this temple as God wants you to build it. The preparations have been made and it's a very important task then for you to put into place. If you remember just other examples, Nehemiah was going to be building the, rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, and he goes and makes preparations and plans about that. Paul, on several occasions in the New Testament, in different places that he would travel, would make preparations and plans. Romans chapter 15, 24, and 1 Corinthians 16, and verse 5. People in the Bible made plans for that which was important to them. And these things, they would allocate certain things, whether it be of resources, time, effort. And therefore, planning was a wise and responsible way to utilize their blessings and to fulfill responsibilities. It is when God wanted them to do something, they made plans to do what God wanted them to do. You know, I don't think it's any different today than then. I don't think we're more busy than they were. I know we utilize that as an excuse. It's simply that as an excuse. People have always had things to do, and they've always felt like they don't have enough time. But what we do is we allow our schedules to get so crowded, and we allow ourselves to get so busy, and we have the intention to do something good. I'll use one. Did you plan to read the Bible in 2023? If you haven't started, there's not enough hours in the day, but that doesn't mean you all do not get started today. You, you, you and I make plans, and then we, we get crowded in all the things that we let creep in, and then there, there comes a point to which the deadline is here. And we go, whoops, I didn't fulfill it. And whatever it was, and I forgot, we'll say it slipped up on me. I meant to do this, I meant to do that. We made the best plans, but we didn't actually fulfill it. We, we let time go by without putting any effort into what we planned to do. And that happens in all aspects of our life. But if we will make careful, intentional planning, then we can help with this problem. If we will allocate our responsibilities and our time where appropriate and the resources, we can do the things that we plan to do. We see example after example in the Bible that there were things that God wanted done. He gave the plan for it, and then the people put it into action. You know, I don't think that coaches that are successful show up to the game and look at the opposing team and go, they got some tall guys on that team over there. Hey, let's, let's play our tall players in today's game as well. Not a successful coach, anyway, that would make that sort of silly determination. They plan for it. They're going to watch video. They're going to see what plays the other team plays. And they're going to try to prepare in such a way as to try to win. The military is a good example. They're always planning. They're always practicing. And when you get something that is of such importance to you, you and I want to get it right. And we put forth effort into it and we plan as much as we possibly can to get it right and to get it right the first time. In Matthew 16, if you'll be turning over there, Matthew 16, we understand as we're turning over there that making plans is important. And so we work through plans. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 26, Matthew 16 verse 26, a simple statement in this teaching. He says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, what about your soul? 
I know it's a silly example, but to say the coach shows up to the game and he doesn't even know the size of the players or the type of uh, scheme that they'll play in their player. The military shows up to fight a battle and they don't know how many they're going to go against. Those things, while we may say it's a certain level of importance on those, are not as important as our soul. Your soul has value. And the value of that should make us come to our senses. That making plans and preparations and putting them into action in our lives can help us to take care of our soul. Don't you want to secure your soul's salvation for eternity? Let us not be so short-sighted to think that all that there is is here and now. And that we have a lifetime of time here to live in which to do these sort of things. If the president was coming into town... You will make preparation for that. The entire town will make preparation for that. If you're going to go coach in a football game, you will make preparation for that. But what about Judgment Day? Will you make preparation for that? Will we kick the ball down the road a little bit and say, I'm going to focus on that, make plans for that, and I intend to do that later? Or will you serve Him Now, will you look at ways to glorify Him now so as to secure your soul for salvation through the blood of His Son? You know, when I was a teacher, we had this fun thing we got to do every month without fail, a fire drill. And, you know, I never caught anything on fire while I was teaching. or And I never knew of anybody else that did. One time we used a fire extinguisher. The principal did. But past that, never did the fire department come rushing in to put out a fire in the school. But every month, every student, every teacher knew exactly what to do. Why? Because we put a plan into place and we practiced that plan month after month after month. It was important. Because if there was going to be some sort of disaster or fire or whatever it was, we wanted to be sure that we were safe. And we wanted to be sure that we had everything ready for that situation. And we were prepared for that situation. What about your soul? Without planning, without preparing, we tend to drift and we tend to procrastinate. And God doesn't want you to procrastinate. And He does not want you to drift. He wants us to make the most of our time, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16. So planning is wise for us. Look in James chapter 4. Let's for a moment, I want to, just for a few minutes, I want to consider some excuses as to why we don't plan. And I want to put them to bed. James chapter 4, sometimes planning gets a bad rap and sometimes we dispel planning and we say, I don't need to do that because if I plan, I'm taking the future for granted. And you may not have used that excuse, but if it's ever come into your mind, I want to talk about it. That if I'm planning, then I'm just thinking that I've got the future and I, and I have that. And I just don't know that. I mean, the preacher has been preaching about that, saying that I don't have any idea about the future, whether I have it or not. So I can't plan. Well, James chapter 4 and in verse 13, it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, can you see the point I'm making? I mean, it's right here in the text. You can see it and you can say, well, here's a guy... He's making plans. He made plans in verse 13. And then the Bible says, don't be like that. It says that in verse 14. Do you see it? That there's this guy that says, he makes these plans. And then the next verse says, hey, you don't know whether or not you've got tomorrow. So you can't take tomorrow for granted. So you, just, you don't need to plan. Well, look at the next verse. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. See, the planning wasn't the issue. The planning wasn't what the problem is that's being talked about. The problem was a wrong attitude towards viewing the future. In viewing the future, it was if the Lord wills, if there is a future. I'm preparing and I'm planning 
passage isn't teaching against preparing and planning. I'm preparing and I'm planning for the future, but I'm doing it with the right attitude. I plan and prepare with the right attitude that says, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. We should not be guilty of assuming that the future won't be there. That's not the issue at hand. But that making our adequate plans and responsibilities in the future, if the Lord wills, is essential to our growth and our responsibilities. We need to be sure that we utilize the time that's given to us appropriately. That we be ready for it. And we see ways that we... Can grow because you're making plans does not mean that you are taking the future for granted. You might say, well, planning is not a good thing to do. And that's what some people would say. And planning is not as good as as doing. And I can understand that and agree with that. So how about this? How about planning is important and also fulfilling the plans are important as well. As we read just a moment ago, and I told you to remember that, 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 10, where it says, Be courageous and act. The way that he puts it to Solomon is this. It's not just knowing what you need to do, but actually putting it into practice. Actually doing it. And so Solomon, here's your admonition. Be courageous and do it. You've got the plans, the preparations have been made. Go through and carry out that plan. When people do that, when we do that, we see planning involved with it. And then the actual putting it into place and the action helps them to be better. I'll just use it as a real quick example. What if I didn't plan my sermons? How would you feel about that? Would you be, and I mean personal, you get personal about it. Now, would you be all right with me showing up, getting up here, and say, well, I didn't really prepare anything for this morning. Uh, I'm just going to wing it real fast. You just sit back in your pews and hang on. Just watch. Would you be okay with that? Now, you may say, well, that sounds fun the first time. Well, it doesn't to me. But, but we may say, well, let's see where this, where this ends up. But if week after week I just showed up and you said, I, the court puts no preparation, zero effort at all, you know what you'd be doing. You'd be looking for another preacher. You'd be talking about him and you'd be saying, we've got to do something about that guy because he's not putting the effort into it. What about the song leaders? Aren't we glad we have good song leaders? And yes, I know we all are. But they plan and prepare it. And I'll tell you that you can verify it. Connor can verify it. They've got their songs planned and prepared before I do my sermons sometimes. They're on top of it. They put effort into it and we're thankful for well thought out songs that correlate together and teach good lessons. And maybe sometimes we'll correlate with what we're going to be studying about. You know, it's, it's great to talk about those planning, but putting it into action is where we really recognize the benefit that comes from that. Look in first, or 2 Corinthians excuse me, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> the excuse that I want us to notice here is that, li- is that we need to live by faith. And yes, that's true. But living by faith doesn't mean that we exclude ourselves from actually planning. Uh, this verse is not saying just wing it. Just kind of do your fun at the time. That's not the idea that's being talked about uh, here. Uh, this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. And if we'll just take that and we'll say, see, we're not about to make plans. That's not what it's talking about here. You know, we, we've got to just live by faith. Just let each day come, however it be. It's taking the verse out of context. We recognize that just at the onset. And notice it just easily. Verse 6. He says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. If I take verse 7 and I pluck it out of verse 6 and verse 8, I come up with an idea that is incorrect. What he's talking about here is the distinction between being here on earth in these bodies and being in heaven with the Lord. That's the comparison that he's making. That Christians should always be looking forward to that which is to come. When we'll see Jesus, when we'll be with Him in heaven. But it says right now, 
Physically, on the earth, we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, I'm not there yet. I I don't see the Lord, but I'm walking by faith. I'm living by faith. I'm trying to be with Him in terms of my living and in terms of my faith, but I'm not in heaven yet. That's what He's talking about. He is not making a distinction with... Don't make any plans. Just live however you want to live. He's not saying anything about that. There's far too many examples in the Bible of people that are making plans and preparations. Paul's a good example, Romans chapter 1 and verse 13. He was planning to be with the brethren in Rome. Do you think he wasn't walking by faith because he made plans? No. The same apostle wrote that we ought to walk by faith. Here's the plan that he had in place. Good intentions. And then he followed through with those plans. Wouldn't we recognize the good and the plans that we make? And then put those good plans into practice. Now the Bible doesn't tell us that we've got to schedule each and every moment of our lives. It doesn't tell us that we have to itemize it down to the minute and the second. And I recognize that you can't plan everything in your life. And sometimes it is okay To just wing it, if you will. But not on important things. Not on the things that really matter. When it comes to the matter of your soul and your eternity, you need to put some effort and preparation in making some plans. So I want to give you some suggestions for that. Some spiritual suggestions. I want to do that on an individual basis and I want to talk about that in a collective sense, some things that we can do collectively in making plans so that you leave today and as you start to look towards the new year tomorrow, that you've got some concrete things that you can do. And I want to encourage you in that. And that we have some concrete things that we can do collectively together and we can work together in these ways. I want you to start with me over in Ezra chapter 7 on these. Just practical suggestions and um, and things that we put into into our lives that can help us, some plans that we can implement. Ezra chapter 7 in the Old Testament, I want, you to, I want you to make plans to get the most out of Bible classes and sermons. Not because it's me that teaches the sermons or it may be me that teaches the Bible class. That's not it. But because of the effort put into God's Word that we study and teach from God's Word. And I want to suggest to you that you can do something about what you get out of the classes and sermons today. In Ezra chapter 7 and in verse 10, it says, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is the plan that Ezra made. He said, I'm going to study it, I'm going to know it, I'm going to put it into practice, and I'm going to teach it to others. And so he put his effort and energy into what was important in God's Word. He said, I'm going to study it. I'm going to practice it, and I'm going to teach it. Now, the context, as you continue reading, shows that God was with Ezra and it helped him to leave Babylon and come to Jerusalem and started carrying out this plan. We should make the same plan for ourselves. The plan is just as good then as it is today. We get a benefit of coming together, a benefit of meeting together like we are now and studying God's word together. So how can you get the most out of it? How can you take advantage of Bible classes and sermons? Well, it becomes a priority in your life. What does Sunday morning look like for you? It's Sunday morning now, so I'm, just think about it. What does it look like to you? Well, maybe if you've got kids like us, you get out of bed and you're trying to get everybody dressed and ready to go, and it's kind of a hustle, bustle to, sort of trying to get at Be sure everybody's hair is fixed at the house. It takes me less time than everybody else, but... We want to make sure that everybody's presentable and we get ourselves together and we get here. And, you know, that's all well and good. I want to look presentable and you want me to look presentable and those sort of things. But do we prepare mentally? Do we get our minds set around it? Or is it that in the first, let's say, 10 minutes of class or the first 10 minutes of the sermon, we're still kind of settling down? 
from Sunday morning? I, I don't know. I can't answer the question for you. But if we've lost the first 10 minutes of Bible class because we're settling down, or, or we're working in the first 10 minutes of the sermon figuring out what our afternoon plans are, or where we plan to go to lunch, or things like that, we're cheating ourselves. We're, we're cheating ourselves because of these other things. Whereas a little bit of simple planning would help us. If it's constantly on your mind as to what you're going to do this afternoon, make those plans before Sunday morning. And if it's something about Bible class that it's the first few minutes of class that, that we've got to work on settling down, I don't know, just throwing out ideas, then that's something we can start to work on a little bit earlier. We can put some effort into We can get up earlier or whatever it might be, put a practice into place for that. That's just one idea. For Bible class, do you read and study the lessons ahead of time? Do you put effort into that? You can. You can start doing that and look through the verses and be ready to learn together and to discuss together and be ready to think about the material. Do you take notes during the sermon? I'm not saying that, that you have to write down everything that's said. I'm not looking for stenographers, but it's a suggestion that helps many in the sermons to be able to write down things and to take notes. And it's useful then to some. Look in Ezekiel, if you will, chapter 33. Ezekiel 33, what if you made some simple plans to prepare for Bible classes and sermons? And what if, what if, after the Bible classes or sermons, you made plans to implement them into your life? You know, because really that's why we're here. It's good to study, and we should be studying, and it's good to encourage one another. But we have to take the things that God wants from us, from His Word, and actually put it into practice in our lives. Ezekiel 33, and look in verse 31, it says, They come to you as people come, and sit before you as my people, and hear your words, but they do not do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. Behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not practice them. Here's what he's saying. He's saying they listen to what you have to say because they enjoy it. But they don't actually put it into practice in their lives. They don't have any plans for that. Maybe it is that Ezekiel is a good speaker and they want to hear what he has to say. But as far as changing their life, forget about that. As far as make, making the distinction, and, and, and I know I'm, I'm complimenting you for taking good notes and I, I get that. I'm not trying to berate anybody that's not. But if our taking good notes doesn't equate to actually a change in our life, I'm, I'm just wanting to be blunt. What difference does it make? We have to be able to take the, th the things that are true and make an impact in our life. We can highlight all we want to in our Bible and underline and make notes and write things down and those sort of things. But if truth hasn't been applied to your life, what good does it do? Is it the, is it the Jefferson Bible and the Smithsonian that you don't like pages and you cut it out and you just get rid of it? We might as well just leave it in or give it to somebody. Truth has to be applied to us. And so what can we do? Well, maybe, just an idea, take five minutes. When you leave today, or in the car ride or something like that, take five or ten minutes and, and meditate on what you and I can do to improve. Just take ten minutes and maybe talk about some adjustments that you can make, that you need to make. Some habit that you're going to start or some plan that you're going to implement. And, and then continue to build in that way. In truth, apply it. If we're not applying it, we're wasting our lives away. Make some plans to get the most out of Bible classes and sermons. Collectively, I don't know if you know this, we've got a gospel meeting plan to come up in the spring. And the, and the speaker, uh, he's all right, relative, I guess, if you've seen the, the list. And, and we'll do the best that we can. But isn't it something of greatness 
when we have an opportunity to study together, maybe we bring in a, a visiting preacher or something of that nature, and we make plans for it. How great are gospel meetings when we put effort into the planning and we've prepared our minds and we, and we center them around a, maybe a theme of study and effort is put into that, that intensive time together of study and edification of one another. And those plans are available to us and all we've got to do is take advantage and put it into practice and implement it in our lives. All right, let's switch gears just a little bit and we turn to Matthew chapter 19. Something else that we can make some plans for <clears throat> and put some implement, of, and we can implement these today. We don't have to wait until tomorrow, but we can start by planning to read the Bible. Now, if you stop me if you've heard this before. It's normally the sermon that comes at the beginning or the end of the year, depending on when the first is, that, that the guy's going to get up here and he's going to talk to you and he's going to encourage you to be reading the Bible. But it, it, it's a daunting task because we look at it and we think that it's so long. But we don't have to try to eat the elephant in one bite. We can work and plan and prepare and change our lives to put it into application. You see here, the Pharisees were coming to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, and they have a question to ask them. And it's Jesus' answer that I'm interested in in Matthew 19 and verse 3. He says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing Him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Good question. Many in our society ask it. Many amongst us will ask that question. And Jesus answered and said, Have you not read about he who created them from the beginning, made them male and female? Have you not read, is what he said. The answer is available to you. Did you read your Bible? That's what he is saying there. So Jesus, whom we will face, we will, we will face in judgment, ask them, Have you read? Will He ask you and I if we've read? Will He ask us if we've put it into practice? That the Scripture that's been revealed and available to you, that you're holding on to this morning, you have an expectation from God to be well acquainted with. There are so many plans available. It's, it is just mind-boggling to me. I had someone send me a website this week where you could go make your own Bible reading plan. I can share that with you if you want to. I'll put it on, uh, email it out or something. Just let me know if you want it. And you could decide, these are the days I want to read and these are the books I want to read. And you chronologically or in order as it's in your Bible, you can determine how you're going to read through it. I just want you to read. I want to implore you to be readers of God's Word and not in some sort of entertainment, though you may enjoy it, but to actually get into the Word to study it. We've got the plans available. Do we implement it in our lives? I don't plug apps as far as giving you an endorsement of it, but I utilize sometimes, I utilize the version app, and you may have it on your device, but I don't know. Did you know that it has plans built into it? And that you can sign up to utilize them, and it will, on your device, it will remind you every day, don't forget to read. That you can, I've teamed up with folks to do this before, I'd be happy to do it with you now. You can team up with someone else on there and encourage one another to read. That is, that is let's say Christina and I team up on, the, on there to read and it will tell me, Christina did our Bible reading today, are you? Oh, sometimes competition sets in a little bit. Maybe that sounds silly to you, but whatever it takes to encourage you to read, utilize it. If you need an accountability buddy, we'll, we can get you one. And help us, and let's help one another get through it and put it into, into practice. You know, we have such great benefits because you can read the Bible and you can do it legally. You can go buy it. You can, you can have it. You can give it out. I, I'm, just, I'm just convinced there's not an easier time to be reading the Bible than today. Literacy is at an all-time high but are we reading our Bibles? Let's make plans to do that and to follow through. Look in John chapter 1. I'm going to give you something else to do. So I've given you a couple of things already. <clears throat> John chapter 1. I want you to be specific. You're looking towards the new year. I want you to be specific and thinking about someone that you can reach out to in the next year. I said, I said by the end of the year, and as I was making this, 
I was thinking about the first by the end of 2024, but then I thought, well, how silly of me. You've got today. Why waste today? Reach out to someone today. Make it a a focus in your life that this is what you're going to try to do into helping others. In John chapter 1 and verse 35, it says again, The next day John was standing with two of his disciples, that's John the baptizer, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Jesus is the one that he points them to. John Points these two people in verse 40. Notice what it says. One of the two had heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Isn't that interesting? He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. I sure am glad and thankful. That John the Baptizer was willing to say something to these two men. That these disciples of his could be pointed to Christ and the impact that they're making. You never know how an invitation is going to work out. And if we're honest about it to ourselves, that's really what scares us. Is we don't know how an invitation is going to work out. And most of the time what we'll say to ourselves is, I don't know how it's going to work out and I'm afraid I'm going to get turned down. But might I caution that we may be just as afraid that they'll accept the invitation? And we won't know what to do as far as teaching or Bible study with others? Maybe there's something else for us to be preparing about there as well. John just makes a comment to Andrew. And Andrew tells Peter... How many people did Peter invite to Jesus over his life? We have ample opportunities. Inviting someone to a Bible study or to visit the assembly is not like anything else. It's not like inviting someone to a birthday party. I get it. It's easy to invite someone to a birthday party. There's going to be cake and presents. We get nervous about it. But isn't it important to do what God wants us to do? Make a specific plan. Utilize the, the things that we have collectively available for us. I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago on Sunday night that we have those cards out in the, in the foyer and to grab five and to give them out. And who knows what will come of those. But to simply pass them out and to invite someone. It, it, it becomes a habit when you start to make it a habit. Put some in your wallet and then hand them out. Put some in your purse and then hand them out. And then when you find that opportunity, you're ready for that opportunity. We have our website. It's up to date. It's running well as far as I know. We've got plenty of sermons and classes on there to invite people with. We utilize social media. All sort of opportunities. But if we don't plan to use them, we won't use them. Plan to do it. And then put that plan into place. The last thing I want to encourage you to do individually, I want to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. But Ecclesiastes chapter 12, as we noticed this last thing, the last thing I want to encourage you to do to make a plan to do is to teach. To teach a Bible class. If you've not taught a Bible class lately, take advantage of the opportunity to do so. We have opportunities in our kids' classes for, uh, for our members to be involved in that and to be working in that. He says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you will say, I have no delight in them. I heard a profound statement from a fellow preacher back in the spring this year. He was talking about children's Bible classes. And he said something that really kind of hit close to home for me because he said the church is going to need elders. Will the church at Wiley need elders? Yeah, the time will come, if the Lord wills. Well, the church will, he said the church will need preachers. And the time will come, if the Lord wills, wherever that might be. He said those little boys in class back there. Have you ever stopped to think about that? That the little boys sitting in the class in the back, that you're shaping their hearts for God, is the way he put it can grow up because of the effort you put in to lead the next charge, to lead the next generation, to lead brethren. 
Teaching Bible class is important work. And if we put it off and we find it of no importance for us and parents don't do their responsibilities at home and all those sort of things, the future can become scary. Teaching a Bible class is important. So take a quarter. Let the elders know today which one you want. Take a quarter and sign up to teach. I'll promise you this. You'll learn more than the kids will if you'll teach a Bible class. You will learn more than the kids will by you putting forth the effort to teach. Challenge yourself to do that. And if you're unsure about it, the opportunities around there, I'm willing to encourage you and to help however I can in that. And I know others are as well. We have experienced Bible class teachers here. And, we, and they're willing to let you sit in on class and to assist you and to help put it together for you, with you, and to, and to help guide you in that if you need that assistance. I appreciate the good work that's done in our classes. And we need, I, have, I think about the fond memories that I have of Bible classes when I was a little kid and growing up in Bible classes and some of the incredible teachers that I had. It's a wonderful work and a wonderful opportunity. And if you haven't done it, take advantage of that opportunity and teach a Bible class and sign up to do so. Just four things that I put that you can think about and you consider as you make plans for your... Life. Put them into place today. When we think about spiritual planning and those things that I mentioned there in that lesson, we miss out on what's most important sometimes. We make all sort of plans for things in our life and we miss out on the ultimate of importance. Planning to use our spiritual blessings and planning to use our spiritual responsibilities wisely. People in the Bible made plans. You and I have the opportunity to make plans, and there are some things that we can implement today. We can implement them here collectively, individually, in our homes, and we can utilize our life in service to the Lord. How important is your soul that you would plan for it or not? If we can assist you in your service to the Lord in a public manner this morning, let us know as we stand together and as we sing.